Welcome to the Robert H. Jackson Center. And for those of you who joined us last year for the comedy and First Amendment discussion, welcome back. We're delighted to see you. I was just about to tell you that I am the new president of the Robert H. Jackson Center, but I think I should take some advice from Justice Jackson. He said, on your first appearance before the court, do not waste your time and hours telling us so. We'll likely discover it for ourselves. <laughs> and for those of you who will be here next week as well for the uh, FCC versus Pacifica Foundation, the seven dirty words you still can't say discussion, I'll do my best to come up with fresh, in all senses of that word, uh, material for that. And I am thrilled to introduce Journey Gunderson, the Executive Director of the National Comedy Center. We're very excited to host her this evening. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome. I'm Journey Gunderson, as you just heard, and this is a special being recorded for Sirius XM Radio and presented by the National Comedy Center. So a couple of things. One, you'll forgive that I will be reading remarks because, hey, it's radio. And you'll ignore that after a brief film clip, I will be introducing myself again to start the show. We do want to preface this evening's conversation with a brief sequence of clips that demonstrate something of the breadth and ingenuity of Kovac's body of work. From his landmark silent show and innovative Dutch masters commercials to his experiments with electronic effects. This is a refresher for you, the audience, and a way to bring us into the eccentric, wondrous mindset of Ernie Kovacs. Let's roll the tape. There's a standard formula for success in the entertainment medium, and that is uh, beat it to death if it succeeds. Let's take questions tonight. Now, at one time, uh, the final gun duel was the big thing, and we were satisfied to see this. After westerns practically filled the air, it was the general feeling of the trade that at least they could vary the gun duels which occurred some two, three hundred times a week. One of the more iconoclastic producers of uh, this year has a new series ready called Rancid the Devil Horse. You know, the fellows here in the control room have gotten to like Dutch masters so much they've asked me to turn off the air conditioning. We just smell smoke. Yeah. <laughs> 
Good evening and welcome. I'm Journey Gunderson, Executive Director of the National Comedy Center. The National Comedy Center exists to recognize comedians as cultural innovators. Celebrating a craftsman like Ernie Kovacs gets right to the core of that mission. His work did more than push boundaries, it shattered them and marked the advent of a new type of bold, irreverent, popular culture. The Kovac Centennial is the perfect occasion to revisit his indispensable body of work and to present the contributions of Ernie Kovacs to a broad swath of visitors, from the most ardent comedy fans to children encountering the weird and wondrous mind of Ernie Kovacs for the first time. The Ernie Kovacs Centennial exhibit opens August 7th at the National Comedy Center in Jamestown, New York, and celebrates Kovacs' artistry and influence by showcasing never-before-exhibited archival materials, rare clips, and screen-used artifacts from Kovacs' career. And now to introduce your host for the evening, Ron Bennington has been called the best interviewer in the business. In addition to hosting Bennington daily with his daughter, he hosts two critically acclaimed interview shows, Ron Bennington Interviews and Unmasked, talking with the greatest creative minds of our time, including Alan Zweibel, Louis Black, and the Smothers Brothers, Dan Aykroyd, Simon Pegg, Paul Feig, Amy Schumer, Jim Jeffries, Tracy Ullman, Gilbert Gottfried, Chris Elliott, Sandra Bernhardt, Bobcat Goldthwaite, David Brenner, Judd Apatow, Brian Reagan, Joan Rivers, and over 150 more comedy greats. He is also a headlining comedian and just returned from Just for Laughs Comedy Festival in Montreal, where he debuted his new show, Creeps with Kids, on tour this fall with Robert Kelly, Rich Voss, and Jim Florentine. Please welcome Ron Bennington. Let's uh, bring out the uh, panel tonight. Uh, our first panelist is a TV critic since 1975, guest host uh, for NPR's Fresh Air, and he's the TV critic for them. He's a professor of TV and film and the author of four books. Let's welcome David B. and Cully. Come on. Everybody. Hello, I'm sitting here. Yes. All right, he's one of the original writers for SNL. Uh, he's won five em Emmys, uh, two Writers Guild Awards, created, co-created its Gary Shandling show, wrote a best-selling book, Bunny Bunny, uh, about Gilda Radner, and of course, co-wrote 700 Sundays. Let's bring out Alan Zweibel. Alan! He's an actor, commentator, headlining comedian, playwright, and best-selling author. Six comedy specials, nine albums, five Grammy noms, two wins. Uh, you know him from The Daily Show. He's the voice of anger in Pixar's Inside Out. Let's bring out the king of rant, Mr. Lewis Black. Lewis. <laughs> All right, we're going to be talking, of course, for the next hour about uh, Ernie Kovacs, who would have been 100 years old uh, this year. Um, and we'll start this off with you, David, since you're the uh, television expert. What made him so uh, important? Um, I think there were four things. He started at the very beginning of television when there were no rules. And so anything that he did that was original really was original. So he played with special effects and with the very crude technology of TV at the time more than anybody else did. That's one thing. He had outrageous characters uh, that he portrayed. Uh, you didn't really get to see any of those in the intro, but anybody who's here probably remembers them. Uh, number three, he was really good as a host as himself, just talking directly into the camera and then uh, my favorite fourth element for him is that he was also an amazing television critic. And so he would do entire sketches, and you saw a piece of the Western one, where he would deconstruct the foibles of television. He did one where he was talking about sex 
uh, on television, and he complained that there wasn't enough, and <laughs> and showed what a weather report would look at uh, would look like if they just beefed it up a bit. I don't know why they haven't done that. It was brilliant. Well, you need to watch more Spanish channels because uh, they've definitely caught on. Yes. Uh, you know, Louis, I'll say this to you. I find the most amazing thing about him is that he didn't work in front of a live audience, so he never got that feedback that it takes to kind of edit comedy a little bit. Well, that's real courage yeah. and stupidity. Because <laughs> uh, it really, partly it's radio, because he comes out of radio, so you, you know, he has that. Um, and it's partly, uh, I, you know, I watched a lot of his stuff again, and you, you sit there and go, wow, he, he really, he didn't seriously give a shit about a punchline. <laughs> I mean, he would do things that would go on and on. And, on, and beyond where you, you should go and further and, and you know, he, you know, I mean, and I, 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 but I remember watching him as a kid and thinking it was mind altering because nobody, you, you, I mean, he's doing this while the things that are on around him are, are ludicrous in, in there. You know, it's like there's leave it to beaver and then him. <laughs> so, uh, so I think it, it really, it, in the end though, I think it, it's what made his genius was the fact that he didn't put an audience out there because he would start kind of thinking in that fashion. Well, and a lot of these shows were on for hours a day, right? Isn't that the strangest thing about it? TV had just started and I guess they didn't know that, you know, it's not radio, you know, the people <laughs> would be sitting there watching it. Uh, Alan, what about for you? What do you... Uh... Well, you know, not only was it not radio, it, it, it wasn't vaudeville. It wasn't stage acting. When you look at the infancy of television, you look at the people who were in burlesque and vaudeville and hitting the back row in a theater. And then they came to radio and they made the transition to Jack, Par not, no, pardon me, Jack Benny, uh, Burns and Allen, Fibber McGee and Molly. They were used to playing in front of audiences and they were used to playing out. Now, if you look at his clips, you look at the ones he just showed, or if you go on YouTube, as Lewis did this afternoon, because he never heard of Ernie Kovacs <laughs> until today, okay? Uh, He's a quick study. Okay. You got, <laughs> he, not only did he not give a shit and not have an audience, you had to lean in a lot of it. You had to observe. I mean, him drawing the lamp and then the socket, you know? And I agree with you, when he exited, Today, you would have cut a lot quicker than to see the whole exit, or even the pan down to the uh, Dutch master's box of cigars took forever. They had all the time in the world. Maybe there was attention spans or uh, whatever it was at the time, but he was innovative. I don't, you know, I keep on hearing about him uh, breaking the boundaries of television. There were no boundaries back then. So he created his own in a way, which is really cool. Yeah, I think that's probably the only reason he was able to get away with it, right? Because they didn't know what they had yet. Yeah. You know? I mean, and I think it just it, it, the kind of, it, the, he was, it, what makes him truly intriguing, he was using that medium as an art form. That what the, the options were within the, the, the little sound thing at the bottom, all of those kinds of things that were potentially there were, th he was using the, 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 the medium itself as, as another character. And that is astonishing uh, in its own fashion. Uh, do you think, uh, David, it was because he didn't have to worry about ratings, there wasn't a lot of competition well, when he went on? The amazing thing about Ernie is that he was never very popular. He, was, he would have specials or series called the Ernie Kovac Show. He never even bothered changing the titles <laughs> and it would get canceled by one network but picked up by another because dutch masters the sponsor loved him he sold cigars so it didn't matter how many eyeballs he got he got mouths you know um and so from from 1950 he started in local tv where it was live and then once he got to prime time he just 
He failed brilliantly on one network after another, and he kept getting better, and the ratings kept getting worse. <laughs> you know, but nobody cared. You know, his best shows near the end, I marvel at them, and I don't think many people were watching them because exactly what Lewis was saying, the choices on the other channels really were insanely calm or insipid. And with Ernie Kovacs, you had no idea uh, how to deal with him. I had no idea that uh, no one cared the entire time that he was working, that none of these shows were hits. Yeah, no. No, they weren't. They, they weren't. They couldn't even survive for long, but they were brilliant. And what I like is that there was always somebody in charge of television who said, I want him. Oh, you don't want him anymore? I want him on my roster. But he was never batting cleanup in terms of the ratings. But even back then, it's nice to say it didn't matter. Or especially back then. <laughs> Only back yeah. then. <laughs> Only back then. But, you know, we've had comedians, like, uh, people will always tell you that Albert Brooks' uh, movies didn't make as much money as we all believe they did because we watched them a hundred different times. Uh, and those are the kind of things that stick, right? Well, these are passion. Um, these are certain people have had the uh, ability and certainly the luxury of doing what they wanted to do uh, timing and circumstance made it such where Albert, you look at his movies, you know, um, Defending Your Life and all the other ones there, Albert did what Albert wanted to do. And um, yeah, if it didn't do well at the box office, all Albert cared about was, well, they let me do another movie. It didn't matter. He didn't need a bigger house. And, um, the, you know, it was... Um, it wasn't as corporate back then either, you know, and I know this sounds very hackneyed now, but uh, the movie studios, um, the TV networks were a little bit more mom and popish. okay? So you, if you had somebody at the helm uh, who was an executive who was an Albert Brooks fan, he gave Albert Brooks money. You know, right now, who, whatever corporations own whatever studios, they don't know Albert Brooks from anybody, you know? Mm. Uh what about for you, Lewis? Is there somebody that you had growing up or watching when you were a young person that, that you thought was much bigger than they turned out to be? Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Alan's not big? I had no idea. Uh, oh, this is, no, this the, is... um... <laughs> I mean, I... Uh, well, I mean, when they took... Uh, like that was the week that was off the air. I was Ooh. like, what? How could you do that? That's like, really? It's been on, it was not on for, it was on for like 10 minutes. It was two years maybe, max? I don't even think it made it to the third year. And I was like, this is, how do you do that? Because I thought millions of people were watching. I also thought that, I thought McGovern was gonna win. <laughs> <laughs> So, but you know it's really also <laughs> extraordinary when you're watching him because I've watched so much of it. Is is that he, I mean, which would drive people nuts now. You see, you can't even, you know, I imagine if you showed it to uh, younger people, you know, he's he's got a cigar, he's smoking a cigar, every everything he's doing, no matter what he's doing. He's there's a scene that I watched a few times because I just thought it was ex extraordinary. Uh, him and Edie are playing, and they're playing caveman and cavewoman. He's a caveman, and he's smoking a cigar. <laughs> so it was really that, and, you know, and now kids would go, oh, yeah. you know, that's disgusting. In the Nairobi trio, he's an ape smoking a cigar. <laughs> I just think the president of uh, Dutch Masters was yelling, this is fantastic. <laughs> I don't care who's watching it. We've got every one of them yeah. smoking cigars. Uh, they're uh, going to have some stuff, which I haven't had the chance to see uh, at the National Comedy Center the, the, to celebrate uh, him at his 100th birthday. Have any of you guys got to see it yet? No, I, I mean, I, I just begged went and I, they yeah. wouldn't let me crash the gate. Yeah, we saw the curtain that covered it. You saw the curtain that covered it. Yeah. I kind of feel like, and I think this would be great, he's alive. I think 
Ernie's just going to be sitting there smoking a cigar, <laughs> going, I got you, right? Uh, uh, let's go back to you, Dave. Give us something that, uh, you know, they, uh, we brought up the Niobe Trio, which is so bizarre when you found out some of the people that were in those costumes. Well, it was, it was most of the times when it was filmed, it was a trio, hence the Nairobi trio. Ape suits. You should probably suits, explain it. Hence, you should probably explain what, okay. yeah, it's, for folks who don't know. There's an Italian song called Solfeggio, and that song was played on the soundtrack from start to finish. <laughs> Three people in ape costumes <laughs> pretended to play it. That's all. <laughs> That's all for like 11 years. And if you can imagine it as a three minute YouTube video, incredibly popular, minimal variations. Two apes always tried to hit the other one or do something. And, and the piano playing was like this. There was a conductor with a banana most of the time. <laughs> Describing it doesn't make it <laughs> seem any funnier. <laughs> but it's fascinating, and the music is playing, and so the people under the costumes most of the time, Ernie Kovacs, an ape smoking a cigar, Edie Adams playing wonderful piano, she was a great musician, and Jack Lemmon. Wow. And wow. it's one of many things, I, I teach early TV history, and I save until like the end of the course, Ernie Kovacs. And when I get to him, my 18 to 22 year old students, their minds have to be picked up <laughs> off the lecture floor. It's, it's really fascinating. How did it work out that that was Jack? Was it a buddy of his? Was yeah. Yeah. Close friend. Did Frank Sinatra, was he, was he at once? Because I read somewhere yes, that... Yes, I hear that he was such a big fan, he asked to be an ape once. I was never able <laughs> to tell... To ape, yeah. I, I was never able to track down which Nairobi trio. Yeah, because if you look at that middle ape, with all due respect, because I thought Jack Lemmon was a very handsome man, <laughs> that was him. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. How... how Strange and funny is it that, like, say, Frank Sinatra, you have the biggest star in the world on your TV show, but don't let anyone know yeah. Yeah. that he's there. <laughs> that's right. That's a guy who really doesn't give a shit about that's the ratings. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, uh, you brought up uh, Edie Adams and uh, his... I mean, to me, Edie Adams was one of the most beautiful women I ever saw in my, in my life, but what I love about it is she used to sell cigars on television, uh, which, um, and she's the one that I guess kept a lot of the stuff that we have today, she's right? She's absolutely to be given credit for keeping him going. Well, now, now the Comedy Museum is, but yes. Well, when I was doing a show called It's Gary Shandling Show where we played, uh, Shandling and I played with the form a lot also, and she became a fan of that show because in deference to, to Ernie, and also that's the way her mind went. And I think her son, Josh Mills, now yes. is the keeper of yes. the estate and uh, watches that stuff. Well, you know, go back to uh, what, what that first show that you did with Gary. That also made zero sense to anybody who was watching it. I, I appreciate that, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but, you know, but that was uh, one of those great TV shows that you're like, I cannot believe this got on television. Well, was once again, it was timing. It was probably not unlike the way it was at the infancy of the networks. Here you had uh, the infancy of cable. They needed product, and uh, Showtime um, needed, they wanted to go into the comedy business, and you know everything just lined up, and they let us do what we wanted to do with very little interference. So we were very lucky that way, you know, and we were, and, and we didn't, but they also, we didn't abuse it. The fact that we were on cable, we didn't use four letter words or anything like that. And they, um, you know, uh, they, they were great about it. And, and so I understand the comparison in terms of playing with the medium and also how did you sneak onto television? There was some, right. you know, 
a little bit of wonder about that. Well, that's not the first time in your career, too. You started at SNL, and that was another one of those shows that everybody went, what the hell is this? Yeah, well, there was Lorne. He found uh, 10 writers who uh, had never worked in television before. So we didn't know what the rules were. <laughs> okay, so the only rule that he told us the very first meeting was, let's just make each other laugh. And if we make each other laugh, we'll put that on television. And he said, I'm telling you, there's a generation, a baby boomer generation that's not being spoken to in variety television. They'll, hopefully they'll like it and tell their friends. And that's exactly what we did. It was We put on the fourth grade play every week. Um. <laughs> It seems like oh, it's okay, worked second out, grade. Okay. Second grade. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's so funny that you've had a couple of opportunities like that to be, uh, and you know now Netflix is here and they're doing something interesting. They're going to give uh, Eddie Murphy seventy million dollars for doing an hour. <laughs> Are you so, shitting oh, me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, they. Uh, you know, I'm, I have to go lie down. <laughs> well, they've offered him. I think he's counter offering as we speak. Uh, but that's that's what it's. That's another one of those times when there's a new platform, something comes along that no one even imagined. The difference. Yeah. If I may, Ernie Kovacs, brand new medium, pushed in every direction. Uh, Saturday Night Live, late night pushed in a lot of different directions. It's Gary Shandling show on Showtime, went back to George Burns and breaking the fourth wall, but then deconstructed it, went into new directions. Eddie Murphy, don't know what he's doing for, what was it, $300 million? It's gonna be 70, <laughs> but he'll have to work an hour, no break. I, <laughs> well, oh, well. <laughs> He deserves every penny yeah. then, yeah. 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 I, I, I'm not, I, I would expect at that rate, very funny television, I would hope. I would not necessarily come to it expecting groundbreaking. Mm. So that's the difference. Unless but, he could bring, if he could bring in uh, an alien ship <laughs> <laughs> while he's performing. <laughs> Then he's really <laughs> lowballing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really. You have yeah. no idea how this is turning <laughs> yeah. my game. I can't get a. I can't no, get no. A, a special on that. You got to be kidding me. No. no. But let's go back to Ernie before I I start weeping. No. <laughs> <laughs> because right now there are noises coming out of you <laughs> that I've never heard from an adult before. <laughs> Can I say one thing while, while yeah. he heals? I do feel your pain. I don't get that at all. Um, I had to figure out how to teach Ernie Kovacs and <clears throat> because here's something that surprised me. When I started teaching uh, 20 years ago as an adjunct, 10 years ago full time, 100% of my students who were 18 years old coming in would have seen like the Holy Trinity. They would have seen uh, the Honeymooners, they would have seen I Love Lucy, they would have seen The Twilight Zone. About 80% of them would have seen Andy Griffith. Those were the ones I could count on for them to be familiar with and have seen a complete episode before I showed it in class. Today, with everything available out there in terms of streaming or DVD or everything, Lucy is down to 50%. Uh, wow. Andy Griffith is about 15 percent, and these are, I mean, this is not anecdotal, these are all my classes put together, and a hundred students at a time, and uh, uh, Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone is only about 40 percent, Star Trek less than 10 percent, so that surprises me, so Ernie Kovacs, no one, <laughs> no one. <laughs> And so I finally, how do you teach it? And I thought the best way is to wait until the end, until they've seen all the other TV from the 50s, and then show them an entire episode of Ernie Kovacs. And this is just what a special was if you would have watched it in 1960 or, or 59. And they're astounded. Well, I gotta say in their defense, if you go to YouTube, 
uh, there's a cat that's scratching a guy's balls. I saw it today. <laughs> it was 18 seconds, and then you were done. You could move on. I don't know, I, you know, the, the way people watch things today, I don't know if they could even understand Twilight Zone. I don't know whether your brain works that way. For if, if you go and watch a cat scratching someone's <laughs> balls, what do you need the Twilight Zone for? <laughs> 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 no, but we were talking before. I mean, that, that seems to be the big paradox over here, that there, everything is so accessible. You don't have to be in a room in front of a TV at a certain time on a certain day. It's always accessible. And what I don't understand, and forgive me if this sounds trite, with so much stuff and the accessibility of it, I don't understand why those percentages are so down. I mean, I, I don't know what it's attributable to. I honestly don't, and it saddens me to a degree. I was telling the guys backstage a few years ago, I was over at the University of Buffalo, and they had me teach uh, for a week uh, a course in comedy writing, and I needed some, I wanted to show some film, and um, the head of this, uh, of the movie department, head of the movie department, I said, can you send a runner uh, at the like, Blockbuster? You know, uh, and I named some films and I said, oh, also I want Annie Hall. And she looked at me and I went, you know, Woody Allen, uh, Diane Keaton, <laughs> Annie Hall, won the Oscar in 1977. And she said, Alan, I, I was only born in 1970. And I said, well, I was born in 1950, but I know who fucking Lincoln is. <laughs> I so I don't get it, you know? I'm gonna let that laugh roll yeah, for a little yeah, while. No, I'm gonna, gonna give you that. Just roll. <laughs> well, you know what I find uh, also interesting is how um, because we were having this discussion too about him, was he gets lost, Kovacs, that he gets lost in the history of, uh, of television, even, even within it, mm -hmm. um, even within the framework of it. You, you kind of go, you got, uh, you know, um, you know the, the Burns and Allen and, and, and uh, uh, the Honeymooners, but he never, he never gets his due. He, he kind of, you know, his stuff with her, with Edie, is... Uh, a lot of Burns and Allen, uh, but in, but the next generation of Burns and Allen, and uh, and somehow it just gets lost, and, and I and I've never understood why, because it kind of disappeared, and then all of a sudden it was the early '60s, and we go on to a whole other group, and but somehow he never got his I felt due, and I don't know, I really don't have any comprehension of how that happened. Do, do you? It, it's especially surprising since David Letterman grew up watching him and was yeah. a big fan. And so was Chevy Chase. Yeah. So here you have the two kind of, these two icons of television and film. They'll, they would bring his name up during interviews and yet didn't well, seem well, to go past that. Here's, I'm sorry, I don't dress like a professor. I normally don't talk like a professor. Here's my professorial theory. A generation ago, when we came home from school, the canon of television was on in syndication in the afternoon. It was the only time parents weren't around, so we found what we wanted to watch. And what we watched was I Love Lucy and The Honeymooners and what was there. That became the canon. Ernie Kovacs was not part of that. There weren't enough shows from one source to syndicate. And it wasn't as easily graspable as a, a sitcom with re repeating characters. So he got lost along the way. What's happened in this current generation, there isn't the syndication model anymore. There isn't the any one place where anybody goes to watch things. Even children, if their parents have cable, and if not, someone should call Dyfus, you know, and rescue them. But, you know, <laughs> they go from like Nickelodeon to Disney to MTV, everything is stratified. So, where would you see this stuff? The most humbling and horrifying thing a student told me once was, they asked, why should I watch this old good stuff that you want me to appreciate when there's so much new good stuff? 
I said, you're right, let's burn the museums. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because, I mean, Skelton is there at the time and, uh, and gets his due. And, and somehow, it, I mean, it, it, what, I, what I kept thinking as I was watching Kovacs this go around in, 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 at, at this point in my life was that, Ske uh, that, that Kovacs was Skelton on acid. <laughs> and he was. That's great. And I'm not, That's kidding, great. And I'm not kidding around. He does a 20 minute piece that we, uh, but, but both of us watch today, in, uh, called Eugene. Eugene, in which at the beginning he says, you heard, a he writes this thing out that, you know, you, you've heard nothing from the moment the milkman arrived and talked to you. All you heard all day was talk, talk, talk. Everybody was talking. For the next 20 minutes, nobody's going to talk. And he has 20 minutes. <laughs> Nobody speaks. It's just this character, this weird character doing these strange things, much like you know, a, a, a Clem Cadillopper, but if Clem Cadillopper had taken like Owsley ass. <laughs> That's strong. Because he, you know, the room gets smaller. It's all, you know, he, he paints a door. He opens the door that he painted. He comes through the door. He's now holding the handle. He puts the handle back on the door on the other side. It's psychotic. And you kind of go, you know, how does that not end up being uh, on that level. I, I just don't know. It just and maybe but also be the fact that n n not as many people were, you know, less people were watching than I thought. So you would think when they're exposed to it, then that yeah. makes all the difference in the world. But uh, every time I show Ernie Kovacs to 100 students, I predict in advance, five or 10 of you are gonna adore this. Um, five or 10 of you are gonna hate me for showing you this and making you sit still for a half hour. And then there's a bunch of you in between. And it is almost that. But the five or 10 students who adore it, they go out, they get all the DVDs, they go onto YouTube immediately, they find everything they can, and they start making student films and just pushing more right. envelopes. I, I just wonder uh, aloud here that we've been talking about um, Burns and Allen and Jack Benny and Jackie Gleason and uh, even uh, Red Skelton and um, there were characters, okay? With Red Skelton, yeah, it was Variety, it yeah. was Freddie the Freeloader and Clement the Diddlehopper, but there was still, he did a monologue and he said, may God bless, and, and you sort of knew who the guy was. And I'm just wondering for a mass audience, and I, and I don't say this with a lot of conviction because I never thought about it, but I just wonder if we as viewers it's easier for us to hook into a personality where you think you get to know Ralph Cramden and that one room, that kitchen and Alice and you get, you know, the shortest log line in the history of TV Guide, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I was always told was five words and it was for the honeymoon, it was the Cramdens get a phone, okay? <laughs> and those five words told you everything because you knew those characters and you knew that that would be really interesting because Ralph wouldn't want it and Alice would have to hide it somewhere or something. So I'm just curious if at the inception of TV at the beginning, if it was easier for people, yes, they did have the cachet, they knew him from radio perhaps, okay, or the stage, was it easier to follow a uh, character that, as opposed to working a little bit harder uh, and looking at the weird stuff? Oh, that's the guy who does the weird stuff. I just wonder. What do you think? I, I think it's. It, I think that's pretty true. Of that, it's the. It's that thing. It's got no. It's it, it's a, it's a, it it's that thing. Kind of. It's so far ahead. It's that. It's timing. He's out of his time. Mm -hmm. He's twenty years ahead. Yeah. And we of, 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 of it and of the curve, which I do think kind of puts him out. It's he, like a, a totally different language being spoken. I mean, he did have very memorable characters. I mean, Percy yeah. Dove Tonsils yeah. is <laughs> men on film, you know, 30 or 40 yeah. years earlier. And, uh, and Carol Burnett became very famous, very popular on television, playing different characters more than showing herself, yeah. but Ernie did a little of everything. He was hopping all over the place, and so much, he was ahead of the technology. I yeah. mean, later on, when Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In came about, and it did quick cutting uh, comedy and jokes every few seconds, that's what Ernie was shooting for, but 
they couldn't edit fast enough. The cameras were too bulky. Yeah, the, the interesting thing there was, was that Rowan and Martin were doing Olsen and Johnson. Yeah. They, okay, so they were doing a form of burlesque with cl I'm slamming the doors and all good. of that. That's yeah. Good. Oh, I know stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it, we, we don't have a... I'm not dumb like everyone yeah, says. Yeah, yeah. Smart. Some smart. <laughs> smart. But we don't have this tradition of visual comedy once we got television, particularly playing around with the technology. Nobody else was really playing with technology probably until we got to computers. And if you look at kids now, where they'll find a meme to be... Unbelievable, yeah. you know. But maybe the, he wasn't. Maybe he was like sixty years out of his time. But the other, yeah. I mean, the other thing is, is that uh, when he, in '51, he's got a show coming out of Philly, I think. Yes. And uh, it's like a morning show, and uh, it's one of the first, you know, kind of talk show things. And his desk is just covered with crap. I mean, it's like <laughs> nothing you've ever seen. There's a moose head behind him. It's half lit. Um, there's a hat rack that falls, things fall over, he trips over stuff. They make no bones and they laugh about the fact he'll walk up, he'll walk into a, a camera on purpose, smash his face <laughs> against it. It, it, it just never, it, it, it kind of is just, it, there was no, he was making fun of something that hadn't even happened yet. <laughs> And, it's, and, the, and I just wanted to tell, because I thought it was such an amazing, uh, one of the things that I saw, that I, in, in terms of the Burns and Allen aspect of it, he, they're playing this, uh, the, the two of them are playing, uh, uh, you know, the, um, <coughs> they're playing cave, caveman, cavewoman married, and, and he's inventing stuff right and left, and she's, and it's all sorts of, some of it's, some of it's like a wheelbarrow, it's all sorts of, you know, a phonograph, it's insane. He's, he's making this stuff and smoking a cigar. And they're talking, and then all of a sudden, uh, she breaks character and looks at the camera and goes, you know, I, for those of you who don't know, I'm married to him <laughs> in real life. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that he will be at home and he'll say, I have this really great bit and we're gonna go do it on TV and everybody's gonna think it's great. And I look at him and go, this isn't funny. <laughs> We're not going to do this. And then he says, yeah, we are. And we just did it. And it wasn't funny, was it? <laughs> and then she goes, <laughs> and then she turns back to him and goes right back into character again. <laughs> I love that. You know, it's kind of interesting that he was doing that in Philly because Philly ended up having this great tradition of children's shows where people would just be working directly to the camera. I was thinking about Gene London and, and a lot of those people. And I wonder if that kind of got picked up from him. Um, it may have. He, it was so early in television, he didn't have the chance to pick it up. I mean, 1950 is when he was doing local TV. There wasn't much to pick up from, you know, before that. TV was on a few years before, uh, but not a lot, not every day, not every hour of, of an afternoon. Most local stations didn't even have local shows. So I, I don't know who he stole from um, <laughs> other than just himself and, and whatever he was smoking because th there's, there's a joke. I don't know if you caught it when you were looking back. He, he opens a show and there's a lot of bodies around the stage. Yeah, he walks over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, no, there's no studio audience, but he's walking into where the audience would be, walking over these dead bodies. <laughs> and he says, sometimes the crew doesn't clean up so well <laughs> after the untouchables. <laughs> and, and then he said, well, we were just sitting here, you know, uh, I'm going to try to quote it correctly. The crew were just uh, sitting around um, drinking and smoking tea, uh, drinking tea and smoking. <laughs> and I thought, is that a pot reference in 1960? I bet it was. Yes. yes. Yeah, of course it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. And that explains a lot of Ernie Kovacs. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but is there any record of him working in front of a live audience at any time 
Yes, he yeah, has. there are some existing shows. If you get the collected sets, there yeah. are some. My, my favorite is when he's doing Percy Dove Tonsils, and it's supposed to be a little bit of magic that he does where he makes a, a three ounce martini disappear by putting a handkerchief in front of his face, drinking it. <laughs> <laughs> what makes it funny is that the crew substituted the water that was supposed to be in the glass for straight gin <laughs> on live TV and he reacts to it and explains it and it takes him about 25 seconds to just swallow it. It's brilliant live television and I will say that my college students adore that clip. Sure. <laughs> yes. I saw another piece too once that he just took a kaleidoscope and put it on the camera and just sat there and turned it. And you're like, this is really good TV. You know what I mean? Like, it was really fun and interesting. And cost 30 cents. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, this yeah. afternoon I saw, I wonder if you did too, he's in a bathtub. Yeah, we it's, were in the same room. <laughs> in a bathtub. That was you, that's right, I forgot. <laughs> so, so then you'll recall. Um, the bathtub, the, the head in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah. He was in the bathtub, smoking a cigar, oh. bunch of bubbles, oh, no, right? Is. He leaned back a little bit just to stretch, and then they widened the shot. Both of his legs were sticking out of the side of the bathtub. It wasn't over the top. It was like out of the side of the bathtub. No water spilled out, and he was just as if his feet were on a hassock and he was very comfortable that way. <laughs> you go, wow, this is pretty interesting stuff. There was a boardroom that had a picture of a dam on the wall. And all of a sudden the dam broke <laughs> and water came oh, yeah. onto the, into the boardroom. <laughs> wow. And you've written a lot of television and most, most writer, writer's room, they don't think visually first, right? You're no, going visual comes for, last, yeah, absolutely. Comes last. Yeah, unless the joke or something is based on something physical, no, you think about dialogue first and then, um, you know, there are subtle kinds of uh, things that augment the comedy, which is wardrobe and, you know, what, whatever your dress is set with. But yeah, because writers' rooms are uh, frat clubs. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're fraternities. Uh, yeah, whether there's men and women, but it's going around a table making jokes, and that's verbal. You know, I want to just take a break in this panel about Ernie Kovacs to remind Lewis that uh, Netflix is offering $70 million. <laughs> To Eddie Murphy, and I know you started enjoying yourself again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to get you back to yeah. full Louis yeah, Black worry. mode. Yeah. I'm, I'm back. Yeah. 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 Those, those noises are starting again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you started, Louis, uh, writing plays, uh, a lot of off Broadway stuff. And uh, that's off, kind of off, 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 off Broadway. Off, off. But that's a pretty lonely business, isn't it? Is to, to get started in the uh, lonely? Yeah. <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. I always called working in the theater was like working in an uh, abusive orphanage. <laughs> um, the lack of a laugh there shows the lack of understanding. <laughs> That's how come we, the theater has done so well <laughs> in my lifetime. It's that, uh, what's he talking about? Um, it is, it's lonely only in the sense that people don't show up. Uh, yeah, I can <laughs> otherwise, it's great. Yeah. But, no, but otherwise, I mean, there's something, what really is the attraction of theater is the, is the, the fact that it's a family getting, I mean, you, you, you form a family and you put something together. And you're really literally kind of, I think that's the attraction for many of, uh, folks in, the, in that craft. Um, you form a, a family for a time, and what makes it a really great family is there's a shelf life. So you can <laughs> love these people, and then, ha ha, I'm not gonna see these bricks again. Right. So it was, uh, so yeah, it was, it, Writing was was uh, was uh, a certain amount, it, but it was it's it, it, you know it's it, I, I always really loved it. I loved writing for theater. And when you tell you, really yeah, I mean, coming from live TV, to to be uh, in the back of an audience and seeing 
what they're, uh, that what they're laughing at or not laughing at something you wrote that morning. There's immediate feedback, and it's really thrilling. When I was doing uh, 700 Sundays with Billy Crystal, I would wake up in the morning, I would go to the uh, business center of the hotel, write new material, we would put it into a rehearsal at noon, and then at night, 500 people, this is when we were on the road, would tell you whether or not what I wrote that morning was funny or not. And there's something very stimulating about that. There's something really So cool. that would change right up until you locked it? On until Broadway? we locked it, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and even when we went to Broadway, um, I would still stand in the back and go, you know, maybe we could do better here, or a new joke can go into this place over here. It's um, Live TV does that for you once a week, and here, this could be every night if you don't have anything else to do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, but my attraction to, to theater always was, in the end, uh, that uh, was uh, so, little, so little technical stuff. No technical shit. No, I don't need three cameramen. I don't need any of this. I just... I need two chairs and a table. I don't need, you don't even need a plate, really, if you want to do it. And, uh, and that's really the kind of what makes it, and the, and the joy of creating a, a reality that all, everyone shares in, except well, for well, this group that came tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look at early television, yeah. Yeah. and you know, once again, the, the Cramdens were in that kitchen. Yeah. All right, and even um, all in the family, by and large, Archie and Edith were in those chairs, you know, so it was people talking to yeah. each other. So there is a, a closeness that happens and there's something really um, familial that happens, yeah. Yeah, I always love the fact in, in that kind of theater that you start off when you see there's just two chairs and at the very beginning of it, as an audience member, you're like, uh-oh, I'm gonna be here for the next hour and a half. <laughs> I hope this works. And then when it does, it may work better than mm -hmm. any other form of entertainment that you have. And what, what I thought of today, uh, I get three thoughts maybe in a week, but what I thought of today <laughs> while watching him was he's uh, really, uh, what Ernie was, was the equivalent. His, his work was surreal, it's absurd, um, in its in its fashion, and he really is kind of in the sense of television. He's television Zionesco, that oh. he broke all those rules. These guys are good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I you know I, I paid a lot for that fucking education. <laughs> Seventy million dollars. Oh. <laughs> oh. That was a low blow. <laughs> that man has had enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that, that is a good, uh, the Charlie Kaufman films are something that, and I didn't think of it until just now, but the Charlie Kaufman films play around with a lot of that same kind of stuff. Yeah. Although he's having, I think, trouble getting new ones made. Um, again, there was another person I thought was a gigantic star that everybody was lining up for. Not always that way. When you talk about the laughter, the... When you you guys were seeing the clip that opened up this presentation, I was listening for the biggest laugh, and it came from my favorite moment of television in TV history, just about, which was Rant said the devil horse. <laughs> <laughs> which is so wrong and so weird in so many ways, and it's only 10 seconds, 11 seconds from start to finish but that's all you need to have an exhibit, you know, in a museum. That, to me, is Ernie Kovacs. Yeah. It's just no one else would have done that. Strapped a gun with a rope to the hoof of a horse with a mustache and an evil eyebrow. <laughs> I love it. And doing that in real time, it's somewhat easier to look back and write those kind of jokes or write a parody of something. But it's difficult to, to parody something that's popular right away. Uh, well, you have to know the straight line. So that's important. So you have to know what you're satirizing, otherwise it doesn't make sense. You have to know, you know. That all being said, we're probably at a point now where it's harder to satirize certain things because the reality is so 
bizarre. Mm. You, you know what I mean? So, um, I mean, I used to come home at night, and my wife Robin would say, um, hi, honey. And now I come home, and her first words are, you hear what asshole said today, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so, so. You, you know, I hear them uh, clapping, but we know for a fact that he... Uh, he took Western New York, so I don't know. Some of you people are sitting on your set, on your hands. <laughs> oh. oh, oh, you don't know who I meant by asshole. Uh, well, don't point I'll tell to you me. later. Okay. <laughs> no, I think what makes this a difficult time is not. Uh, I mean, yes, the bizarre nature of it, but that I, I've, I've always felt from the moment he started running that it, it was uh, that it is hard to satirize something that is already satiric. <laughs> and that if you read this in a book, <laughs> let's say you took this, this didn't happen, and you just read it in a book, all of these things that have occurred, you'd go, God, this is a funny fucking book. <laughs> <laughs> Look. They got to say something political. Can I say something? Sure. <laughs> Seems like you're in front of the right audience. <laughs> Every morning, I think this is funny, let's see if you do. Every morning, I start my car, it's a button that says, depress brake and start engine. So I say, do you know what he tweeted this morning? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for those people who are sitting on their hands, <laughs> um, when it comes to this stuff, it, it goes across the board in terms of the whole political correctness thing. You know, I don't know if you could have had that you know, rancid uh, do that today with a gun, you know. And, I mean, I was. Oh, you're right. I never thought of that. You're right. Think about right. it. The restrictions. Norman yeah. Lear himself will say if he was trying to sell all in the family today, he couldn't get it on the air with all the different outlets that there are. I was once in an elevator with Mel Brooks. And we were talking, and we went down, the elevator door opened at a floor, an Indian woman came on with one of those red dots in the middle of the head, and, and Mel pointed to the red dot and said, your coffee's ready. Okay, <laughs> now... <laughs> you can't do that joke today. No. Uh, just did. I, yeah, I guess I did. Yeah. All right, we were gonna <laughs> we were gonna wrap this up with some audience questions, <laughs> and uh, I think yeah, they don't trust the audience to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm surprised they trusted us yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to speak. All right. Uh, Here's one. Is it true that Ernie Kovacs was a runner-up to Steve Allen to host the first NBC Tonight Show? Um, he was actually one of the occasional substitute hosts uh, in terms of early NBC late night. Maury Amsterdam was another. Wow. wow. But they're sort of forgotten in the continuum because they never got uh, full time. But yes, very smart audience person question there. I would love to see Maury Amsterdam's tape of him doing The Tonight Show. I can't even, can't even imagine yeah. it. I think that would be fabulous. Uh, can each of you uh, share your favorite own Ernie Kovacs moment? Well, I'll start it off. There was one where he was underwater smoking a cigar <laughs> and uh, blew out the smoke. And when I remember seeing it having no idea, but it was milk that he had. <laughs> And he was just sitting there, smoking a cigar that he had had milk in his mouth. And again, that to me is almost a magic trick, you know? Yeah, a lot of what he did was a magic trick. Yeah. Uh, anybody want to give their favorite that they haven't already given well, away? Well, I, I did. Yeah, I love that uh, Edie Adams moment of turning to the audience and just going directly. Com coming from character, going out of character, and going right back into character, I just thought was stunning. And, and being able to see that direct line. What I like most, and it's hard because there's so many, but whenever you could see the direct moment of contact from 
where, you know, what had come before and what was coming after. That always amazed me, all of those moments. And you watch a ton of his, when you watch his, a ton of his stuff, you really see a lot of that. For me, um, I have to go back to the Nairobi trio because it, it was precision. The comedy was very, very precise. It was about two, two, two minutes, 20 yeah. seconds, yeah. something like that. And it was, there was attitude there. There was no words. It was just this wonderful. Did he write the song for it, or was it done to that song? Oh, no. It was, that song existed. Ernie loved music, the weirder, the better. And yeah. he did early Robert music Robert Maxwell, videos. right? Was yes. that the guy? Yeah. It was, if, if you're not familiar with it, Google it and watch it on YouTube. It's stunning, but it's so precise. It takes its time. You've got these three characters, and they're all syncopated, and then one gets a little bit, there's attitude there, okay? And then it leads me to thinking of the Bavarian clock in your show of shows, which was they were all there, okay? And you had Carl Reiner, you know, with Lederhausen and all of that stuff, and it was an anvil with a, with a sledgehammer thing, and then that got out of sync, and they started beating up on somebody. And of course, it started out regular, but something just went awry. And I don't know if it was derivative, not that Caesar's right is needed mm -hmm. to, you know, to uh, copy anybody, but there was a bit of a line over there. So I'm just enchanted with that. Uh, David, do you have one? Oh, uh, uh, Rants of the Devil Horse, which yeah. I already said. <laughs> and yeah. at a time when I was considering doing a book, my son wanted me to call it because I I made him watch a lot of Ernie Kovacs. He said, Dad, you can call his biography the rancid humor of Ernie Kovacs. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they'd love that. You know. yeah. I, rem I remember another one that he was on a cooking show and uh, he picked up the head of lettuce and started yelling at it, yeah. telling it was getting a big head, so just start slapping it around. And I'm like, there's 24 hours a day of Food Network and we get nothing like this. <laughs> Uh, the best way to learn more about Kovacs from that era. Yeah. DVDs. I, mean, I realize DVD players are going away. You're not going to find him on a streaming site, so you're going to have to go for right now and buy the DVDs. If you do, uh, Shout Factory has done a yeah, really great Shout job Factory yeah. is great of one. compiling... Uh, Who's? I think yeah. the Shout Factory is back yeah. in seat yeah. 113. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a wonderful series yeah. of compilations and very detailed, very respectful, wonderfully transferred. I mean, again, Edie Adams made sure to save just about everything that could be saved, and I love what's available. And, of course, it's going to be at the National Comedy Center. We don't even know what it's going to be yet. Well, none of us yeah. have but been But the box shown. sets are in the gift shop now. Yeah. Uh, they are. I just yeah. went to the gift shop today. Uh, but that should be really, really cool just to see what they have there. All right, here we go. And I, I like to end on this one. Uh, <laughs> if he didn't care about ratings, ratings or audience reaction, what was his inspiration? Why did he do it? Um, I guess that could be asked of everybody who's alive. Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, he had a love and a passion mm. for... for uh, for, you know, um, he had a love and a passion for creativity. Uh, and, and I say that, and, and creativity being not just comedy, just creativity, being able to create. He had a love of it. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and I, I, the saddest thing when you watch him is, that, is to wonder what, what, would have, what would have come out of this, you know, because he, uh, you know, he, he was just he kind of fooling around in a tool shed, and you wonder what the evolution would have been yeah. like. And what Alan said, I think, is absolutely true, that Lorne told them when starting Saturday yeah. Night Live, do what makes us laugh. Yeah. Because uh, you really get the sense, on the live shows, sometimes the only laughter you hear is from the crew. <laughs> and that's gold. That's like making the orchestra oh, laugh. Oh, yes, making the band yeah. laugh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he, it was that, it was a passion, and I think there was a purity of intent. I, I think that there was an I don't give a shit attitude. Yep. He had the opportunity, and he had uh, the means, obviously, in one way or another, to go, all right, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what makes me laugh. And for her to step out of that sketch that way and yep. to do that, I mean, 
who, who gets that shot? You know what I mean? Who's, who's allowed to do that? That's, you know. And he also did this thing. There was a thing that you may have seen that, that, that he does it, that really proves that kind of love of like, of what, that you don't have to be just involved in it. It's just whatever happened. So he's got this scene. And I, f I forget the scene. It may have been in the, the Western. It m might have been in that long version of the Western thing where he's doing it and then this, and then someone comes out. And the person who comes out f falls. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It is, and they don't cut it, and everybody just goes, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> and and they put up, they slate it, and they slate it again, <laughs> and he comes out again, and they do, just run yeah. it, and then he did the way it should have been run. Yeah. But the fact that he would leave something like that in, yeah, it was no. like the first Take two. looper, the first looper. Yeah. yeah. You know what's always interesting about that, the kind of overlooked genius, is that you know if someone else likes that thing that you like, you're gonna be friends with that person probably for the rest of your life. And that's the bonding thing I think that we, we get. I wanna just also thank the National Comedy uh, Center for putting this together. Uh, I think it's, I think to have brilliant comedians talking about comedy is one of my favorite things in the whole world. Thank you everybody, thank you, thank you. guys so much Thanks. for coming out. Thank you. Take care.